brothers and sisters of the Briar, and welcome to another episode of the Pith Helmet Matinee. Yeah, welcome back. And um, what are you smoking there, to, Professor? Well, I have in my Harrington Park, in a very old pipe. I'm not sure what the age of this is. I would tend to think, I speculate probably from the 40s or 50s, I have some old professor. Hmm. <laughs> Is that, Is that Canadian? familiar? Yeah. <laughs> Is that a Canadian, that shape? I do yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, it's a Canadian, long mm -hmm. shape. Really a, a excellent smoker. I've, I've had this for probably about six years and really love the, the smoke off of it. Well, I'm still on Rat Trace Marlin Flake. And I've got to say, I was watching Northwest Pipe Smoker today, Tom, sailing his, his boat over the waters there. And he was smoking some Rat Trace Marlin Flake. Oh, and wow. it, it's in my, as you know, my favorite pipe, my Northern Briars Countryman. And uh, again. And how fitting since we are interviewing the mm. countryman. Very much so. Yeah. I'm looking forward to part two, Professor. <laughs> maybe maybe uh, Ian uh, Walker named that pipe after. I don't country. know. I don't know what the history of, I'll ask him next time I see him. Um, I I just saw it in his catalogue all back in the day and I and it just drew me to it. And I thought I wanted one of his pipes. And the other one, oh crikey, is it the urchin? Sea urchin? Mm. Yes. Yeah, well, that was the one that, that drew me in, and then this one just surpassed it. Well, so. you know that I now have obtained the Ian Walker <laughs> pipe that yeah. I've longed for. The Helix. And so now the Countryman is the next one on my list. But uh, this, this Helix is just incredible. I don't see how he does it. I really don't. Uh, it's just an incredible uh, carving and artisan skill to this bowl. And uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. He is a dedication. It doesn't come easy. This, uh, that makes my fifth Ian Walker pipe. I give up. <laughs> I've got the poker, I've got this. Oh, crack, I'm giving up already. No, I think it's probably about the, on par with you. Yeah. Um, but everyone's a crack, you know, a, an excellent smoke. Yeah, well, leave it uh, there. I know we have a bit of a of a lengthy interview visit today. I'll say maybe more of a visit. Uh, there was a few times that you and I were maybe just spectators uh, in the uh, little discussion because uh, Bob Gregory. And Sir Johnny start going back and forth, don't they? So uh, first, let's uh, see what Commander McBragg has for us. There, Ribble City. Did I tell you how I saved that entire town? No, Commander, and I'd really rather... One spring, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Finally, miles above town, the old dam that held the water back began to creak and groan. I rushed to the dam and threw all my might against the wall, but it was no use. Water spurted from a dozen places. I leaped aside just as the dam broke. And the water roared down on the town. I raced ahead, built a barrier of sandbags, rocks, and trees. But with tremendous force, the water broke through the barrier and bore down on the town with nothing to stop it. Surely you didn't just stand there. Of course not. Thinking quickly, I rushed into the general store and bought every sponge they had. Then I ran out and dumped the entire load in front of the raging water. The sponges soaked up the water. And the town was saved. Marvelous! What an absorbing story. Huh? Well, quite. Absorbing <laughs> story. Uh, he, could, he could have done with him in China. 
Oops, controversial. I... <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I, I will say, it says that he rushed into the store and bought the sponges. You know, <laughs> that's, that's what just what that's the kind of guy that the commander is, right? Yeah. That he, he, you know, spares no expense. <laughs> dumped his entire load in the street. Yeah. <laughs> Happy days. Hello, who's calling? Oh, Sir, Sir Walter Raleigh from the colonies. Yeah, yeah, uh, put him on, will you? Ah, Harry, pick up your extension, will you? It's Nutty Walt again. <laughs> Hi, hi, Walt, baby. G good hearing your voice. Th things are fine here, Walt. The uh, a boatload of turkeys you sent us over here last November, they're, they're still here, Walt. Uh, yeah, they're walking all over London. <laughs> See, that isn't a holiday over here, Walt. Just in America. <laughs> yeah. You got another winner for us, Walt, have you? Tobacco. <laughs> What's tobacco, Walt? A leaf. <laughs> You've got 80 tons of it. <laughs> you bought 80 tons of leaves, Walt? <laughs> oh, you're, you're beautiful, Walt. You, you're beautiful. <laughs> uh, uh, Walt, I, I don't know if you noticed last time, we have plenty of leaves over here in England. Uh, see, come fall, we're up to... <laughs> it's a special kind of leaf. Is some kind of food, is it, Walt? No, not exactly. Uh, what, what do you do with the leaves, Walt? Lo lots of different things. <laughs> are, are you saying snuff, Walt? <laughs> uh, and, and what's snuff? <coughs> you take a pinch of tobacco, <laughs> and you stick it up your nose. <laughs> and, and it makes you sneeze. I, I imagine it would, Walt, yeah. Uh, it go, goes over very big there, does it? Uh, yeah, Goldenrod seems to do it over here, Walt. Uh, tobacco has other uses. Well, Steve, we have our correspondent from down under uh, oh, joining right. us with another uh, review that only an Aussie can do. Yeah. Our friend from the um, Antipodes. I think that's the right word, isn't it? Yeah, looking forward to it. They're always straight to the point. Bang, bang, smile, thumbs down, thumbs up, we're off. Yeah. Well, let's see what he's reviewing for us today. Okie dokie. Okay, Professor. Nice to be back. Time for another quick review. Today we've got McClellan's Red and Black. It's a uh, mixture of uh, Red Virginia Flake and Stoved. Yeah, Stoved. Is it Stoved? I was right. Stoved Virginia Flake. As you can see, a couple of different uh, colour flakes. You can mix and match or just go all the same. Again, another one in the long line of uh, you can't get it no more and, well, neither can anyone, neither can I. But I'll tell you what, this stuff, not bad. Pretty good. Take it easy. Right to the point, right? Blink you and you miss it. <laughs> I, it. That was what you would call a yellow um, jacket he had on there, wasn't it? <laughs> he had my dark glasses on. Uh, uh, I will say it's, it's a, I've seen it before. I don't know that I've tried it, but, you know, the flakes come, it's like two complete different tobaccos in one tin. And so you can mix them to your taste as you are loading your bowl. So I don't know if you'd ever heard of that one before or not. I've not. <laughs> well, that's not, not uncanny for me. It's, it, I, I stick to the brands I can find in the UK, albeit, you know, I've been, people have been very generous in the past, like yourself, and sent me some wonderful tobaccos to try. Um, I've not got the pith helmet, someone might have noticed. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, you dropped your pith helmet. Mm. And it's really just a homage to our two guests today, uh, well, in our second segment. Obviously, Sir Johnny with the uh, tweed cap and um, uh, country attire. And behind me, uh, some cottages. And 
you help you help me in a rendition of Dick Ken John Peel, i.e. do you know John Peel, the huntsman? Well, he was born in the village behind me, which is Colbeck. And I'm a smoking a Duncan Briar, um, which is a Colbeck, as it happens. And in it, I'm smoking um, Sir Robert's, one of Sir Robert's favourite tobaccos, Commonwealth, which is a healthily um, steamed Virginia and Latakia. And it is a, you know, a pucker smoke. Um, really enjoy it. So that's just my little homage to our two guests, Professor. I went up and got my riding crop after right. Marissa with her riding crop. So yes. uh, I, I, I noticed how much the one she chose looked like mine. So I had to I had to grab yeah. it. <laughs> I can I keep it in line with it, if, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if a horse is still going. Well, there you go. <laughs> it was a Clydesdale. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, this um, this village, Colbeck, is in Cumbria, which is very close to um, Sir Robert's place at Kenville. It was interesting earlier on um, listening to, uh, I think one of our fellow YTPC members is up in Cumbria in a cottage this week. I mentioned no names. And uh, he was saying in Kendall, which is the home of uh, Samuel Goweth, Goweth and Hoggeth, um, and of which is touched on by um, Sir Johnny and, uh, in particular, Sir Robert today, um, about the Kendall uh, snuff, etc., from the from the town, mm -hmm. and how difficult our fellow, uh, our friend up in Cumbria at the moment, found it difficult to get some uh, to pipe tobacco from that town these days. So how things have changed. So we're uh, looking forward to that. <laughs> anyway, Professor, we, we're, uh, we've got a mission, haven't we? We, we do. This is going to be a, a bit of a long haul of an interview. And I, I think, though, just the dialogue between uh, Sir Johnny and, <clears throat> uh, and Sir Robert. Bob Gregory yeah. is just great. That I mean, just to hear them talk about the industry, especially the snuff industry, oh, and... Uh, it, it could be kind of explosive, it almost sounds like. Oh, yeah. But it is, it's, it's a kind of thing, it's recorded now for posterity. Uh, you know, we got two gentlemen there with so much knowledge. Uh, it's incredible. Um, yeah, this is a time, everybody, to uh, pause, fill your bowls, get a libation of choice, and jump back in. <laughs> so <laughs> you've been warned. So, well, we'll see you at the end. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Robert, thanks for joining us, because uh, I know no, you've, uh, you've got um, guests today, haven't you? I, I, oft, I often have a chuckle about the, uh, the, uh, the, the food grinders and poor Lady Mary with uh, <laughs> her errant well, husband. This, uh, Professor, Professor, this reminds me, this, this, this so re reminds me of the old Samuel Gower snuff mill, you know. Complete, disor <laughs> complete disorganization, yet we knew where everything was. 
I, I would think he doesn't even have to take a pinch. He can just sniff the air in his office, right? <laughs> Well, it was, it was it was like that at Samuel Gunnis. Do you remember those huge extractor things you had? Yeah, I did. Oh, bloody yeah. yeah. Yeah, they never did work. <laughs> well, we, we had the... Um, did, did I ever tell you about the time we had the um, the health and safety inspector in? To well, I wasn't inspect- wondering how you... <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> well, well, I, well... I, 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 I won't, I won't steal your thunder, Johnny, but I will tell you a, a very quick story, all of you, about the day the health and safety inspector came to the Samuel Gowers factory. And he came into my office and uh, he was probably, I would say he was probably just turned 21. He was fresh out of college, you know, nice white shirt, smart yeah. tie, suit, you know, a, a, a yellow hat and... Uh, toe tech to boots, gloves, the, the whole work, the whole works, introduced himself. And it was obvious he was new to the job. So we took him round the factory and uh, there we are, there we are. You know. And 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 as as always, what you always do is own up to at least one misdemeanor. And and that way you can get away with 101 others. Yeah. And anyway, this chap, and uh, I mean, I can, I can see the factory, Johnny, you can probably see the factory, but these, yeah, gentlemen, the, these gentlemen can't, and, 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 but imagine, you know, we sort of got gone into this sort of um, 18th, 19th century factory, which is full of machinery, uh, which has been um, sort of guarded for the occasion, um, it's, and he's he's going around and hum ha hum ha hum ha, hum, ha. And then he spots this door in the corner. He says, "Oh, he said, what's through that door there?" I said, "It's the snuff mill." Oh, he says, uh, "I better go in there and check everything's all right." I thought, "Oh, bloody hell!" <laughs> and I was like, "Okay, fine, fine, fine." And what you did, you got to this door and you opened the door inwards. And the first thing was there was this very high step, which led into the snuff mill. He got to this door, he opened it, he he looked through the door and all he could see was the big mortar, mortar and pestle and grinding machines and place covered in rubbish and snuff everywhere dust cobwebs oh and he looked at it and he 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 looked in the door and he stepped back and he closed the door he said oh i'm off (laughs) (laughs) he knew he was on a hiding to nothing as soon as he opened the door and we knew he was on a hiding to nothing because there's no way there's no way you could um, protect, put the protection up that they wanted because making snuff was and still is in certain places. It's hands on. You've got to have your hand in that snuff yeah. to turn it, to, to to feel the moisture, to to feel yeah. the heat in it, and so on. And and of course, these health and safety guys they don't understand this. They do not understand it. Modern day snuff machinery, of what? <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, oh dear, oh dear. But those were the, those were the days. Those were the days. Sorry, Johnny, I'm I'm in, I'm interrupting your flow about that. I'm, I'm I'm right in thinking, Bob, that one of your pestles had originally been for making gunpowder. Yes, indeed. Yes, the the original um, um, grinding machine was was a set of four mortar mortar and pestles. And they were all driven by one by one belt, and that was the original uh, seventeen fifty machine, which uh, Thomas Harrison had acquired in seventeen ninety two. But originally, it was up north of Inverness somewhere. I don't know exactly where, and that was originally used for grinding gunpowder for the um, Napoleonic Wars. I think it was George the Third, wasn't it? George the Third um, in the, in the Napoleonic Wars, and then when that when that was finished, which I believe it finished in 1792, um, they had no use for the grinding machine, so 
Samuel Garth bought it. But yeah, it was originally used for grinding gunpowder. Oh. Hence, the, hence, hence the name of the snuff called gunpowder, which, by yeah. the way, is made, which is made by Wilson. So, so what? <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, but you're, you're you're absolutely you're absolutely right, absolutely right, gunpowder. Yeah, Johnny, it should be well, kept as a museum. Well, we're all in the room the together. I, I don't know if you'd like to share a story because I I I could not. I could not tell the story. It has to come from you. But it was about when you and Clarissa were doing a, a presentation for Purdy. Would I? Oh, that, yeah. Well, that... oh, are you okay with that one? <laughs> because Profesh has a bleeping machine. There's no problem. <laughs> it was, we had been asked to present the prizes at the Purdy Conservation Awards at Purdy's gun shop in South Audley Street in London, which was a the annual Purdy Conservation Awards as a sort of great event of the shooting um, shooting year. And the great and the good are there and the Duke of Wellington acted as a sort of compare. And it was just after we'd heard that the Antis had persuaded the BBC not to make any more Clarissa and the Countryman programs. And as Clarissa and I were going in through the door of Purdy's, I said, you realize we're going to have to make a speech of some sort. And she said to me, well, what are you going to say? And I said, well, I don't know. I'll bang on about shooting and conservation. She said, well, that sounds interesting. What about me? What shall I say? <laughs> and I said, well, I tell you what, Clarissa, why don't you say that when it comes to shooting and conservation, the BBC show about as much intelligence as three monkeys trying to <laughs> football? And, <laughs> and I never for a moment thought after <laughs> where I was standing on the podium, having handed out the prizes said my little bit about shooting and conservation and i said to the assembled dukes and great landowners of the country i'll now <laughs> hand you over to my television partner carissa dixon wright who i'm sure would like to say a few words and she inflated herself like a toad which she was tended to do and she said i would just like to start by saying that when it comes to shooting and conservation, the BBC show about as much intelligence as three monkeys trying to f football. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear her saying that, Johnny. I can hear her saying it. <laughs> and, the, and the room collapsed, as you can imagine. And flushed with that success, of course, she carried on in much the same vein. And when we eventually left, and we could hear the Duke's all heading off down to St. James's saying, well, oh, very novel idea. I should love to see a monkey <laughs> football. We <laughs> hope we had a highly successful evening. But the, the following morning, the telephone rang, and it was a chap who ran BBC Scotland, screaming down the phone at me, did she say that? And I said, what are you talking about? He says, you know bloody well, you were there. Did she say it? <laughs> And I said, I've no idea what you're talking about. He said, well, go and buy the Daily Mail. And we knew the sporting press would be there, but we didn't know there was a, a hack from the Daily Mail. And it was all in the Daily Mail. So I <laughs> rang up Clarissa and I said, I think as far as making, as far as persuading the BBC to make any more programmes, we've pretty well pissed in our chips. <laughs> she said, well, I'd fed up my television anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well done, Sir Johnny. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> why, did, why, on earth did I, why on earth did I recommend him in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, in the past few episodes, the tone has been so high. <laughs> 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 Bloody hill farmers are all the same. <laughs> God, it's good to see you, Bob. It really is. Yeah, well, oh, it's maybe. Not, yeah. If well, you don't mind me saying, you've got royalty with you today, haven't you, Bob? Uh, no, not just yet. What? Oh, they're not there yet. What? 
my, my bride's next door, if that's who you mean. Oh, no, no. <laughs> no? Time to save it. <laughs> yeah. No, I've got, I've got royalty. I've got royalty uh, uh, in, in the form of Ian Walker coming tomorrow. Oh, oh so, okay. So I'm I'm just I'm just getting the the lubrication started <laughs> now. Uh, <laughs> you know, you know. Uh, uh, Johnny, Johnny, t tell me. I I you've never really told me about what snuffs you are producing. What 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 are what stuffs are you producing now? Because when when we sort of parted company, I think you you just really started to start mass production. Um, for, for want of a better word, or was it mess production? I can't remember. Um, you, ju you just really started taking it to market. Um, um, and because I've had this sort of 18 months um, yeah. period of, uh, of, of, of not doing anything, um, I've, I've really lost touch. I mean, tell me, you know, what, what, what are you up to? What, what are you up to? Where are you selling it? I know, well, it all I know goes. I, and I haven't tried those contacts you gave me, Bob, yet. But, I mean, at the moment, w what I make goes to um, David Anderson's Mr. Snuff yeah. website. Yeah. And it's so all, he... it all done. And most of it must be sold in America. Yeah. And I got... Yeah. What, I, what, I, got what, are you, what are you making? What brands are you making now? Oh, well, I'm making, I've got about 18. Um, really? Half of them are moist and the other half are, are dry. Ah, uh, oh, right. Um, I mean, one of them, um, one of my favourites is um, a dry, toasted, bright leaf Virginia, but oh. blended with, blended with Perique. Ooh, ooh. That sounds rather. That sounds rather uh, rather nice. So, yeah. what, are we are we are we talking an Irish toast type of type of yeah stuff with Greek? Yeah. Wow. Now, is that a bit, it's a bit spicy? Yeah, it is. Okay. That that sounds that sounds good, Johnny. That sounds very good. Because um, I mean, it, that that is that is a dry smut snuff, is it? Yeah, that's oh, dry. Yeah. Because the, the perique, um, perique, of course, is very wet, isn't it? So you, presumably you have to dry that out. Yeah, yeah, it does. I mean, it's it's um, uh, it's it's expensive to make to make because perique, oh, as you know, is expensive to buy. And then you lose a hell of a lot of it you in do. the dry. You do. Yeah. You, lo actually, you lose about eighty percent of it. Yeah, but uh, you know how snuff absorbs. Um, any flavour. Yeah. And I've actually only just recently discovered that before I grind the perique, if I bury it in the toasted bright leaf, the bright yeah. leaf absorbs an awful lot of the flavour. Yeah. Yeah. That. yeah. It will do, yeah. Um, so, and then there's... Hmm? Do you then grind it together? Do you grind them together or do you grind them separately? And grind them separately. I can grind, grind, dry the brine, the bright leaf. Yeah. And grind it and then toast it. Yeah. And then, then dry the perique. Yeah. Grind it and then mix it. So you've got, basically, you've got a, you've got a, a, a perique Irish toast. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Ooh. That sounds. That sounds good. That does sound good. <laughs> that sounds. I do good. another one. Have you got my dress? I'm not paying David Anderson's prices. <laughs> no. So, oh, so so what do you call that one? St James's Parish. St Jack. And then why. I do another. Hmm. I wonder why. why. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it's, it's not, it's, not, very, not very original. Well, no, um, but for, for, the, for, the sake, for the sake of the other two, St. James's Parish is the only parish in the uh, state of Louisiana where they now grow real Perique, not the Green River, the genuine yeah. Perique. It's only grown in St. James's Parish. 
Yeah. Now, not far from you, not far from you, Professor. Sir, Sir Johnny, are you using already processed leaf or are you using whole leaf? Um, no, I use whole leaf. Okay. Whole leaf and I take the stems out. Um, and so it's just the, just the fine leaf part okay. that gets used. It's interesting that it's interesting that you're taking the whole leaf, the whole stem out, Johnny, because yeah. of course the stem is where the highest highest concentration of nicotine is in the stem. Yeah, well, the the mid rib, you know yeah. the the yeah. But that would that's the one because I remember at Samuel Garris you had bundles of of like twigs. That's right. Yeah, that's it. We used to they they were they. They were mainly ground up for KB. Yeah, because was it for KB? Because, well, it was mainly for KB because we want we wanted we wanted we wanted the strength, and the yeah. the, 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 nic the 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 highest concentration of nicotine is in that is in that middle stem. So that, that was made. dark. That they were dark fired stems. They were dark fired stems. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. They came from uh, Malawi. Okay. Or wherever we could get them. Yeah. What, I mean, that what, we, was what we used to do, we used to take a lovely, a lovely the, stem. The, the, stem, the, the stems were the residue of the 1792 tobacco production. And 1792 yeah. had the highest concentration of, of nicotine. And we used to use the stems that we took out of the, the, the leaf for the uh, Kendall Brown snuff and the NFS. NFS being being a dark being was a dark. Yeah, it was another, it was another black. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Snuff generally it, it appears to be a, on the increase. I was talking to uh, I was talking to somebody at Wilson's this morning, and uh, their snuff is woo going, going it, through the roof. That's all yeah. good, all good stuff. You know, well, Lonnie, this is a personal, personal thing for me. Your first Pinkfoot geese, goose you shot, was that in Norfolk? You, you ended up going into a pub called the Three Horseshoes. Yeah. Do you remember? Yeah. And, and that, just what came through the screen was the whole, you know, the fraternity, the fellowship, the great day out there, harvesting mm. for the larder. And you came into that pub and you handed over two geese. Yeah. And they actually prepared. I assume they prepared one. It was yeah. your, and uh, yeah. he carved it up. And Clarissa did a little tasting check. Well, to yeah. see the dog in front of the fire and everybody together, just you know, enjoying a festive board, it was wonderful. Hey, that's a sin word. You were warned. He on, he on, he on, he on. This jump first thing. Look at that. Excellent. Well, Mark, you, that's marvellous. You can't stuff it. We're going to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> Come and have a look. Look at that. Yes. Yeah, do you? Oh, yeah. Well done. Well done. You focus. Isn't that great? No, no anybody who can cook it for us, other than yourself? <laughs> oh, I'm sure Mark will know somebody. Mark knows yeah. everything. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't yeah. that fun? Oh, Fantastic. Well, yeah, it was a great <laughs> shot. <laughs> Ah, oh, doesn't this look welcoming? Oh, I can't feel my feet. Is that a pint? I look forward to something to eat. Uh, what do you mean something to eat? They're going to cook us the geese. They're going to blandish them. Oh, look at that fire. Damn the first. Hello, good evening, good evening. Uh, look what we've got, look. Oh, well done. Supper. Wonderful. And we got another one. Another one. Lovely. Another one. Yeah, there you are. Look at that. Super, aren't they? Oh, they're lovely. You think we could have lovely birds? You think we could have a little supper? Of course, yes, yes. Are you wanting to help? Let's see. Well, if you can't manage, just send for me. Yes, a bit of plucking. Bit of plucking. Plucking only. Ah, right. Good. like what? There we are. Another fine. What are you looking at? That's for Tony. Good health, and thank you for a lovely day. Yeah, it's been brilliant. Thank you. Here we are. Oh, look. Oh, fantastic. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, 
look at that. Yeah, well yeah. done. Yes, what a start. Johnny, this is the huge week calm on this, I think. No, no, no. Johnny, it's a calm. Good years of practice. What a noble beast. Mm. My first, my first pink foot. Look at that. Look at that. Isn't that lovely? Ooh. Ooh, I think I'd better taste that. Make pink. sure it's all right for everybody. I think Eden's done that before, hasn't he? Mmm. Ooh. Is that good? That is beautiful, beautiful. If I were you, I'd be grateful. Yes, yeah, I'm very grateful. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Oh, dear. not to sell Yeah, well, I mean, that's wild fowling for you, isn't it? I mean, you must have done a bit in your time. Not wild fowling, no. You know? No. no. Oh, hey, no, I mean... That's... Where was that? Norfolk? Or Lincoln? That was Norfolk, yeah. Was Norfolk. Is it a place called yeah. Wareham? I wasn't sure. That's all I wanted to ask. No, it was at Wells Next Sea. Wells Next Sea, right. Yeah. OK, because that pub, I'm hoping it's still going. It looks absolutely perfect. But that's... Pub. No, the pub I think is at Wareham, yeah. No, but we oh. shot the geese shot the geese out on the marshes at Wells Next Sea. Oh right. And that is um again it's a it's a great um uh, you know conservation um example because at one time before the wildfowlers took control of the marshes, people, cowboys were turning up by the train load and getting out on the marshes and shooting the geese on their roost. Uh, and the, the early Wagby, which was the, the sort of forerunner of BASC, stopped all that. And the geese numbers, which had dwindled away to virtually nothing, now there's something like 50,000 pinks yeah. go down there in the winter. And they fly to inland to graze off the sugar beet tops. And there's an arrangement that, that the farmers don't shoot them inland. And it's a, all that get shot are sort of the handful that the wildfowlers manage to shoot. Well, that's what the general public don't understand about conservation and Basque and yeah, how yeah. it's, you know, saved many thousands of birds, probably, you know. Yeah, um, and of course it has, yeah. Yeah. I know it's it's a tragedy that that the you know the the, the single issue animal rights people um, I mean are commercial organisations they're in it for making money and the last thing they're interested in is animal welfare you know banning hunting hasn't saved the life of a single fox oh. quite the reverse the guy be shooting them. And well, the non fox do come across in the countryside that are thinking about having been wounded. If one could have kept it going, one could have, you know, there was a chance one would have educated. That's the more. word, educated. Mm. I mean, I don't know if you came across this, but Billy, good friends of ours up at Galloway, they have a hill farm. And generally, and it was a shooting yeah. estate, was a shooting estate. But people will probably find fox, urban fox. And, you know, yeah. if they find the cub, they pick it up. Then they feed it. Then they go and they let it go wild in the country, thinking, well, an urban fox, generally, in my opinion, can't survive in, in those circumstances. So they generally are going to get shot anyway. No, aren't they, can't, they? they can't survive now. So, well, but again, education. Excuse Sorry, me. A, an urban fox is derived from a, a perfectly natural wild fox. The fact yeah. that it's, it's the fact that it can't find food, or it's easier to find food, scavenging makes it an urban fox. Does it? Does yeah. does it? Does it? Do its instincts not kick back in? Well, uh, they've grown up scavenging. Generally, am I right, Johnny? The, yeah. The no, I mean the, these the, urban yeah. these urban foxes of foxes that have lived in towns now for generations. <clears throat> right, right, right. That's I see. the difference. I, see. And I, mean, I, I, I mean, I don't go to London very often, but the last time I was in London, you, you'd see any number of foxes creeping about in daylight, and they've all got mange and 
Oh, they look shocking. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, re so really, they they do need the hounds in London to keep those <laughs> yeah. those more good <laughs> You know, a good, a good idea. Yeah. But again, if That's I can just idea. say, with conservation, the the gamekeepers would keep the predators down to a manageable level. They wouldn't uh, exterminate them. You know that's not yeah. the the case. I might, again, you know, people don't understand. General public don't understand, and that's the problem. No, the tragedy you see was that, you know, with badgers, the badgers were the most respected woodland creature. Yeah. But they were controlled, and when the Badger Act came in, the badger population has exploded, which is why they've now got TB. And it's the reason that there aren't any hedgehogs left because the badgers are so desperate for food. That, really? Um, yeah. <laughs> really? That they're not eating all the hedgehogs. <laughs> Good God. I'm ground but nesting uh, birds. <clears throat> huh? I'm ground nesting birds. Anything they can yeah, get. All the ground, yeah, absolutely. All the ground nesting birds, birds' eggs. And I, <laughs> you know, as a farmer, for most of my farming life, I would, I would defend badgers from taking lambs but now they will take lambs as well you know it's because there are so many of them there's not enough food to go around yeah 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 yeah, yeah. good heavens above no, that, that's quite an eye-opener is that i didn't i didn't realize that but have you opened that tin yet if you're asking me mine no i i i don't think i will ever open this bob what oh, have you got? Oh, 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 good. Oh, I'm pleased about that because there's nothing inside it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Is it yet? I don't know. Bob, the, you, you, said, around here. you said Steve <laughs> 10 number two and me 10 number three. And I'll say it's awful hard to even bring myself to open 10 number three. It, it's oh. just... So, Don't worry, there's, there's another 5,000 out there somewhere. Don't I'm, I'm, I'm going to get Steve's wife to open up his when he goes off fishing oh, and no. she can send me a little, you know, pinch of it. <laughs> She'll go fishing with this me. Is, uh, <laughs> this, is a, this is a special limited edition I did, Johnny, for yeah. um, a, a USA customer. It was, the, um, it was the original version of Squadron Leader which uh, back in the day uh, contained uh, Parikh. And I, yes. I, re I, I reproduced that. Oh, well, I can't remember when it was now, but I reproduced it. And uh, um, these two gentlemen are in uh, possession of um, a, a, a tin of each. I can't remember how old it is now. I, re I really can't remember. Yeah, and, how uh, lovely. They were numbered one to three. Now, I do thousand. have to ask you, Bob, do you have 10 number one? He can't say, can he? <laughs> I, I, I just, I'm just curious, who, who's the holder of 10 number one? <laughs> I think we've got one, two, and three in the screen right now. <laughs> I've got number one. Oh, I've got number one, so yeah, three hundred. That um, squadron <laughs> leader would be like um, Astley's Elizabethan mixture, or um, um, very similar. What, what did Copes make? Oh yeah, Escudo. Escudo, yeah. You remember? Co Copes yeah, it's lovely. The uh, the Virginia Perique uh, roundels. Yeah, I, in I'm the rough. Sure, I'm pretty sure that was. But do, do, do you no longer smoke a pipe, Johnny? No. Have you? Because yeah, no, I, had, no, I got, no, I got, I got warned off it. Oh well, we've all been warned off it, mind you. <laughs> <I didn't... laughs> I think I mean, the word was bullied, wasn't it? Well, well, yeah. I mean, having having said that, I mean, I've I've barely touched the pipe since March two thousand and nineteen. Bloody hell, I couldn't afford to now. That's not good. No, it's a bit now. Well, Bob, I mean, um, could I interest you in a little snuff? Pardon? Could I interest you in a little snuff? <laughs> Depends on the price. <laughs> well, I, you know. I For mean, you, I'm, my friend, we'll I, come to an arrangement. <laughs> I, I'm sure we can. I'm sure we can. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'll give David a ring. <laughs> but, you know, it, I mean, it's, it's, age, it's ages since I've it's ages since I've had a a, a, a bit of snow. Like, absolutely ages. Um, I can't remember the last time. It's got to be, got to be, two years ago. Got to be. I I I I did in, I did enjoy it though. I did enjoy it. I must admit, it was um, it was. I don't know. It was nothing like smoking, is it? It's nothing like smoking. It's it's more the, direct. The thing, about, the thing about changing from snuff from smoking to snuff is that you really have to persevere with it. Absolutely. And it doesn't it doesn't work if you're smoking and taking snuff at the same time. No, no, I agree. I agree with that. I agree with that. Yeah. But I have to stop altogether smoking before I then went on to snuff. And yet that, and that is, um, you're getting a more direct hit with snuff than you are with smoking, aren't you? But you see, with smoking, a lot of people don't realise this, that it's, smoking is harmless. It's the tar that is creating yeah. the problem. A lot of people think, oh, nicotine, they'll kill you. Nicotine will not kill you. Nicotine is an addiction. Yeah. It's, it's, no, it's, the, not. it's the actual um, burnt product. I mean, I am not. It's the, it's the burnt product that produces the tar that does the damage. Yeah. There's yeah. never been... There's never been anybody who's had cancer through taking snuff. I, I pray I can't God recall. I'm not the first. But, I can't recall, but I'll tell but you... But it I'll may tell. be that in the days that glory period when the 180 years when everybody took snuff and everybody smoked, they didn't know what it was when somebody's nose fell off. They just no, that's, that's right. But you know, <laughs> it, it was cancer of the nose. But I mean, in, in the 18th century, 19th century, um, well, I mean, if you come, if you if you come to Kendal now, you will you will take a walk up the up the main street of Kendal. And you you will glance to your right and to your left, and you will see these little uh, giddles, what we call giddles, passageways, small entrances into a yard. And each of these has a number, like yard number 19, yard number 37, yard number so, and so on and so forth. And there are uh, there, there are dozens of these little yards as you go up the up the up the main street in Kendall. Now, if you go into these yards, you will, you will see that there are some cottages in some and some very small shops in others. Originally, in all of those yards, there, there nearly always used to be uh, a chemist shop, an apothecary, whatever you want to call yep. it. Yep. And, and every single chemist shop in Kendall, and there were dozens of them, sold snuff because snuff was good for you. And yeah. Samuel Garth used Samuel Garth used to <coughs> used to deliver the snuff to all these yards once or twice a week. And that that's that brings another story to mind uh, about how Samuel Garth used to de deliver their snuff. If you go into the old Samuel Garth factory today, you go through to the boiler room and you will see on the walls these two uh, sort of, what can I say, um, painted bricks, painted stone. They used to be painted in white. And on the floor, you will see this, this distinct mark on the stone where like a dividing wall was. And those two um, uh, slots, spaces, they used to house the Samuel Gareth ponies. They had Samuel Gareth had two two ponies, and one one trap or cart, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And the the, the salesman who happened to be a Mr. Illingworth, you may recall the name, Mr. Illingworth. Mr. Illingworth, yeah. Mr. Illingworth worked for Samuel Gareth for many many years uh until he discovered that um he uh, could make snuff for himself but however 
yeah. Um, he used to he used to get on the horse and cart on a Monday morning and load load barrels of snuff onto the cart, and he would go on his merry way selling snuff, and he would come back on a Friday with the horse and cart cart well and truly knackered but but well fed, and uh, he used to he used to dish out the snuff from these barrels into the apothecaries jars or whatever it is they 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 they, they, they kept they, they kept the snuff in yeah and story has it and um this, this story is is documented but whether it's documented in jest or whether it's absolutely true that um one day in the winter in the winter the uh salesman he was on his horse and cart and he was he was traveling in the pennines um the Pennines Professor are a range of hills uh, that, that uh, go up the backbone of, 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 of England. And he was travelling with his horse and cart in the, in the Pennines. And um, he, um, he couldn't find anywhere to stay. Now, because he couldn't find anywhere to stay, it meant he couldn't have any food. But... This particular gentleman, he always used to carry a gun because he would yeah. be tra he would be travelling out with a valuable commodity known as snuff, and he'd be travelling back with an even more valuable commodity called cash. So he always kept this gun, and the story goes that he only ever used that gun once, and it was on that particular night when he couldn't find a hotel, a boarding house or whatever it was, and he had no dinner and he used the gun to shoot himself a rabbit for his tea. <laughs> well, whether that's right or whether it's wrong, I do not know, but it's a one, it's a wonderful story. But yeah, but so, so really this is, this, 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 this story about snuff being healthy is borne out by the fact that all, all chemists, used to stop the snuff and they used to they used to take the ground product and they used to add their own little tinctures of this and tinctures of that and and you know it's a bit like yeah. your, your itself johnny but except you haven't got the horse and cart <laughs> <laughs> yeah got the gun i think he's nodding off he's frozen no i'm, I'm here i just frozen. lost the picture that's all oh thank god for that <laughs> your, your picture's frozen yeah, well, uh, we can we can live without the picture, can't we? Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go on, go on, Bob, with the story. So, so uh, as as I was saying, that um, that 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 back in the eighteenth, nineteenth century, uh, snuff was regarded as a medicine, was it not, Johnny? Yeah, that's right. Which is why you've, um, you know, you, you, that's why. People take menthol snuff and eucalyptus snuff. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Because menthol, good for the, the airwaves. Eucalyptus, good for the airwaves. Yeah, I, I, I could. and I think I think this I think this um, I think this um, <clears throat> deception should be encouraged, particularly yes, in the case of the kids, particularly in the case of the Walter Scott range. <laughs> which, 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 I'm, which I'm given to understand is a, is a fantastic race, and I can't wait to see it. Well, it. Johnny, Hello. you Hello. want to see? Can Johnny. you hear me? Yes, I was going to say you live not far from the Tweed still. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah do, you, do you still get fishing on there, or not on the Tweed? Um, I used to be a member of a thing called the Grayling. Um, the the Grayling Society, the, um, which is where you can fish on all the Tweed tributaries. So you fish the Tevia. No, uh, the all of the 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 Glen and the Beaumont and all those rivers down around Wooler. Yeah, I I was I was wondering if you fished the Tevia because I've fished is it Sunlows on the Roxburgh estate there which reminds me of a ferret you had the Roxburgh rocket ah yes well it's a pity the um the uh, 
the camera bits got off and I can't get it back because I could show you the Roxborough Rockets. It's, it's the, the one trophy that I have ah. of the Boots Handicap 2001. Yeah. Where was that held? Uh, it was down near Ashington. Right. Well, I have a film of that. Ferret. And you, you get present, yeah? And you were presented, I don't know if it was you or the ferret got presented with a prize. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, the extraordinary thing is that the, the BBC said, bring that ferret with you. And I said, no, for God's sake, that's a proper working ferret. It had never been up a, a plastic tube in its life. And <laughs> it won heat after heat after heat. And then there was a point when it started dancing about with its tail straight up in the air. And I thought, that's the point, mate, when you go back in your box, because you're just about ready to bite someone. Yeah. But um, you had a favourite number. I think it was a bit of a, you, nearly a riot. I think it was it number five. Tube yes, number five. Yeah. yeah. That was your lucky tube. It was, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> to speak. Fancy having a lucky tube. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm going to say I'll get that film over to the professor and he'll edit it into the um, the program. <laughs> so we have to relive those moments with the the rigid tail. Yeah, yeah. Right in lane four, the BBC's license plate millions have been invested in Fido, also known as the Roxborough Rocket, proudly presented by Johnny. Good luck to Fido. Go, go, go! <laughs> In lane five, we have Jess. I'm white, you've got white. And in lane six, the yellow lane, we have Braveheart. Yeah. Here's your last chance to finish the event, but we start the race in a few seconds' time. And remember, the first three go forward to the semi-final. Ready, steady, go! Go, Fido, go! Over in ten seconds. And already in lane six, we're Come on, Fido! Fido's going well as well. Come on, Fido! Anyway, gentlemen, I am. Um, I'm worried. I'm about to suddenly get cut off because I can see them the the beans dropping down rapidly. <laughs> Um, Johnny, well, it's it's been wonderful to have you with us. I, I just uh, it's really been great. I don't know if you've got to see any of the Pith Helmet matinees, but we've actually highlighted you a few times before we ever knew that we would have you on with us. No, I hadn't. Bob sent me a, a link to it. And I saw his, and um, oh, they're great. And I'll get the others up. Well, Johnny, it's been an absolute privilege. Um, yes, yeah, it's been great. Thank you very much for that book. And Bob, what a joy seeing you. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that'd be a bit of a surprise for you and the professor. Yeah, there uh, was I uh, expecting dancing girls, but... Um, yeah, Beth, not there. Oh, he's, he's holding up your book. Oh, are you? Yeah. Johnny Scott. And I actually have a copy of your book on my Kindle. I don't oh, know do if you knew that it was uh, available uh, as far as on the Kindle, but I do have a copy on my Kindle. I haven't started reading it yet, but uh, it's it's in the lineup. Start well, from the book. It's better. There's a, there's a prize for anybody who can read it from one end to the other because it's a big book. <laughs> I claim the prize. I claim the prize. I've done it. You've done it, <laughs> but not in one sitting, surely. <laughs> a wonderful book. It's yeah. a wonderful book. Hey, Will listen, you... guys, I'm I'm going to shoot off now, so I'm going to leave you three guys to to carry Same. on. Johnny, I'd yeah. love to talk to you again soon. Yeah. Take we'll care. be in touch, Bob. We'll and, be in touch. And, and, and give, my, give my very best to Lady Mary. Yeah, and mine to Carol. Thank you very much. See you, Steve. Thank you for putting us in the contact. So thanks yeah. for the chance again. I appreciate them. Thank you, Bob. Take Bye. care. Professor Steve, it's been great fun. Thank you very much indeed.
and um, we must keep in touch. I oh, hope you for sure. Book, Johnny. Yeah. All right. Take okay, care. Bye. And All thank right. you. Cheers. Yep. Bye. Bye. What a oh, just a wonderful time of visiting with these two gentlemen and uh, some great stories, great stories yeah. of the industry. I, I really like the part of uh, him talking about the uh, horse, uh, the little carriage taking the snuff from store to store. Yeah. To each of the little apothecaries. I could, I could picture that in my mind. And, it, you know, a day, a time period long gone by. Well, Kendall's a lovely town and a lovely history. In fact, I don't know if um, you're mountain climbers and things like that. There's something in the industry called the Kendall Mint Cake. Kendall Mint Cake. And uh, it's made in the town still today. And it's fundamentally, it's pure glucose. So if you're going on a hike, you know, it's what you keep with you. It just gives you that energy rush if you might need it. Yeah. And I, can I say, the way you've enhanced some of the stories with the films that we've had access to, uh, it just embellishes and gives it even more, a greater dimension to, to some of those stories. Um, one of which is the Roxburgh Rocket, which was... Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll show a little bit more. I showed just a very tad when he talked about it, but let's show a little bit more of that. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, a ferret. <laughs> and and uh, Carissa, I guess, mentions that the grandfather of the ferret in this must have bit her at one point. So. Well, the thing is, she's up for any, you know, they're just great pals. Um, I thought they were cousins at one stage or not. Um, they were no more than just great friends, you know, from a young age. And I think, you know, Johnny was a bit of a hero of hers. So when it was... He may have mentioned it, I, I don't know, he may have escaped me, but he was telling me Clarissa had never ridden, never shot, yeah. never done anything of the, everything that she threw herself into. But yeah, you know, he was so confident with his ferrets and that even at the end of the the race, she went to uh, congratulate Roxburgh Rocket and he nearly bit her. So yeah, <laughs> the, you know, oh yeah, yeah, she's a great sport. So, oh yeah, I mean, you can tell that they're having a lot of fun together. Maybe like, maybe like we do on this. So. Yeah, <laughs> y'all got a funny topic, no? <laughs> one, one day long after we're both gone, somebody might release all of the in-between videos. <laughs> oh, I hope not. We'll, well, bo we'll both have to be gone. By, by yeah, there'll be a probably new world order by then. And they said they should have been on our list. <laughs> so, oh, boy. Oh. <laughs> Well, let's, let's go to the ferret video. Okie dokie, skinny. Hey? Hey, it bites me. You it bites bite me. me. <laughs> <laughs> they always bite me. Have you got your hat? Yeah, it's in my pocket. It's bloody cold out there. What, yes. There we are. Yes, I've never been the same since you put one down the back of my neck. <laughs> <laughs> Where oh. are we going? Up onto, up onto the law. On foot? No, we'll go on. The, we'll go on the quad. Good. Tell you what. I tell you what's new since our day. Yeah. You've seen these ferret locators. Ferret finder. Seen these things now. Just shows you how big it's grown since our day. Look, you know. <laughs> Your little job is going to be to put that on it. Well, uh, then they will bite me. And that's got some sort of electronic gadget. Yeah. In it. And that bleeps. If it goes, if it get, if it kills underground, yeah. then you don't know where it is. This thing will tell you where it is. Well, this little bleep, and it tells you, it tells you the depth. The direction and everything like that. You really are. They revolutionised the game. So um, good. Come on, let's go and see if we can get a rabbit. Yes, rabbit pie for tea. One of these days, I'd love to do a survey on the number of ferrets kept in housing estates. Millions. Millions. Yeah. Millions. You know, when you think that since the war, seventy percent of the agricultural workforce now live in town, it's the way your urban bloke keeps in touch with the rural roots. And it's food. Absolutely. Rabbit pie. Oh, I mean, it's so underrated. Yeah. Hello. Very excited about this ferret bleeper. Yeah, I'll come and give you a hand. Ready to go. Absolutely. Ready? Yeah. No, no. Yeah. Yeah, little things. Well, that will be the great, great, great grandson of 
The original one. Willie? Yeah, the one I had when I was oh, he's ten or so. I recognise the expression. <laughs> OK. Mm-hmm. Well done. Don't you bite me just because no, your great-great-grandfather no. did. That won't bite you. Well, don't you go putting it down. It smells exactly the same. Yeah, Clarit. Jolly good, well done. Dinner. Perfect eating. What is the day, do you think? Oh, I think so. We got enough for supper. Yep, we got a couple. What's a lark, eh? Yeah. That's a bit of ferreting. I enjoyed that. Yeah, so did I. Hello. Hello. What are you doing with that rabbit? Well, I'm just skinning it. Uh, I thought... Cut up. Provençal. Provençal? Do you like mm. a Provençal rabbit? I, mean, I like rabbit anyway, really. Any rabbit. Rabbit with... Rabbit with mustard. Rabbit with mustard. Rabbit with chocolate, even. Yeah. Hey, look at them up. They're pretty. Wow. Because the great tragedy of rabbits is that they're not worth anything, isn't it? Really? It's hard to believe that... Around the time of the Second War, there were uh, trains running from West Wales with rabbits. Trains full of rabbits, you know. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I can believe that. I was once told that um, at the London Fur Market, at the end of the year, there was ten tons of rabbit tails. The only bit ten they don't tons. use. Ten See? tons of them. Yeah. Right, I've got my stick. Base ferret's going down this way of yours. Well, that looks worth yeah. netting. Yeah, well, we'll try and net it off. Yeah. Um, it's going to be difficult, but we'll try netting it off and, and see if we can get a peg in anywhere. It's an awkward place, isn't it? It is, really. I mean, this kind of site. Your ferret's coming up towards you. He's back on the scent. I've got it. Well done. Well done. Oh, good. oh look. That's you. Get the rabbit. Yeah, your other right. ferret's coming back. Hey, okay. here's your other ferret. Come on. Come home, isn't it? Yeah. Good job. Your other ferret's pootling around here. I wish I could find that poem about God being so depressed looking at humanity so he invented the duck to make him laugh. <laughs> What's he doing? Mm -hmm. What's he doing? He's looking at the birds. That thing. Get a little monocular. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah, it's a long time, Uncle. Cool. Here we go. Thank you. You see them? Like the Canada geese? Yes. And the curlews? Yes. And there's an oyster catcher. Yeah, oyster catcher. A little dunlin. Yes. Sea mice, do you see them out there? Yeah. I love watching the little shore feeders, don't you? Yeah. If one gets old, one can sit by an estuary and watch the tide come in and out. Quite happy. Yeah. Isn't that fun? That's a very nasty little thing. Do you want to make four again in the semi-finals or don't you mind? Oh, well, I think it's a lucky lane. But you wanted lane four again for the semi-final, your lucky lane, yes? Yes, that's right. Yeah. I've had a word with Les, the chief judge. He uh, says you've got to go in five. Oh. Do, do you want what to make we... a protest? Well, yes. Yes. Well, we're, we're not going to enter unless we can go in lane four. No, five open going in any lane. Any lane. Judge. But Johnny is threatening to boycott the semi-final if he yes. can't have his lucky lane four. Les is shaking his head, though. No. Quite right. Les, how much? <laughs> I don't think Les is the kind of judge that can be brought. Place your bets there on the first semi-final coming up in a moment or two's time. Johnny, I've got a major investment here. How much you put on? 80p. Oh. Get ready. Get steady. Go. And away they go then. Four. Trap three's turn round. That's Warhol. Come on, Fido. Come on, Fido. Good boy. 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 Good
Corty, a border lad, a rank outsider, won <laughs> twice. Why, it's wonderful, Johnny. Oh, Fido, I'm so proud. Oh. <laughs> uh, I've, I've always wanted to have a pet ferret. Uh, really? Yeah. But my know, father had wonderful. ferrets. He, I was going to say he took cream for it. No, but he, he did have ferrets. And uh, me, I always wanted, I, I, I was doing the uh, casting demonstrations and tuition at a place called Bala in North Wales. Uh, I, I did that for about two or three years with a number of other colleagues there. And uh, when we had the break, I'm going round and this, I said, what's this smell? And I was looking, looking for ferrets and it was the ferrets. And that's the only thing that put me off. I was going to go and buy, buy a couple mm -hmm. of ferrets. But apparently it's the cob, which is the male that smells, funnily enough. And the, and the female's the jill. And someone will correct me if I'm wrong. But yeah, I, my dad had ferrets. So I, I thought, oh, I've got to get a ferret. And um, I'd take it in the pub. I was going to take it in the pub with me in my pocket. You know, you, you sort of poach his pocket, become a pet. Now, I saw my friend down the, the way there. He's got... Um, ferrets but they're more like the polecat uh, variety mm -hmm. rather than like pure white etc but yeah well brothers and sisters i hope you enjoyed uh this episode of the pith helmet matinee i'm not sure if one will be back but uh hopefully it'll be sometime in the the future i i know this time of year we many of us can get pulled in a lot of different directions and uh i know steve's just uh you're ready to go cast a line at any moment, aren't you? Well, we, Shane and I talked about it and um, we thought there's going to be, a, you can go over the, into Wales now, but there's going to be a mad rush for everyone going to their caravans and holiday homes and the fishermen are going to be flooding the river. So we thought let the initial wave die down a little bit and then um, we'll, we'll go and have a venture. In fact, a near neighbour of mine at the back, we... You know, you have neighbors, but he's at the back and uh, I had occasion to be talking to him. He only used to be a ghillie in a former life in Ireland on the rivers there. So we got talking. So he wants to go fishing with us now when we go on. To, so it'll be at least three, I think, when we go. There we go. So now are you going to be taking the uh, VW bus? Well, again, we at the moment, we, we would have to travel separately. So, uh, yeah, we... we I may, well, I'll put it off today, but we may get a curly finger tomorrow off Shane to uh, meet up and do our second part. So hopefully people find, well, if you've seen the first part, there's a bit of a taster there. But yeah, yeah so well, uh, by the time we put this uh, video up, you probably will have had the, a chance oh, to have that. Hopefully. People should definitely go and take a look at at the oh, video. He's I done a so. tremendous job, absolutely. But I mean, he is working for himself, so it's all a matter of, um, and he's just been away. We would have done it this weekend, but yeah, well, he's single, Shane. You know, he's a free man. And uh, he, he got an invitation to go to the VW Singletons Club, which is uh, people with VWs and campers and everything. And they were at Coniston in the Lake District. So they've been up there for the weekend. So, oh, he's probably still there. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but uh, when he gets back, um, we'll we'll do a bit of filming. Well, I'm glad y'all could join us for this episode, and uh, uh, stay tuned. Uh, be sure to check out Three Rivers Channel and subscribe if you're not subscribed. You need a few more subscribers. I'm uh, fine. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> I am fine. I, I, I appreciate everyone that has subscribed and I appreciate every viewer. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm just grateful and thankful. So, no, I'm, I'm fine. I'm happy. If people are happy, then please do. Yeah. So, well, till next time. So, enjoyed it. So, God Take bless. Take care. Take care, everyone. Bye for now. talking about <laughs> where do we go from here professor uh i would think there should just be a, a button to turn the camera back on yeah sure let's kick off right professor so three two one so yeah i thought that was funny